Now let's open our Bibles to the book of First Peter, First Peter chapter one, and today we'll be reading from verses thirteen through sixteen. And let's all rise together in the reading of God's word in reverence for Him and for His word. People of God, this is the word of your Lord. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as He who called you is holy, and you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, "You shall be holy, for I am holy." This is God's word. May God bless you with His word. Good afternoon, once again, and uh, it's an honor to be able to share the Word of God uh, with you. Uh, we're looking at First Peter chapter one, uh, verses thirteen through sixteen passage, which is very important for all of us to read and to understand. Uh, and that's because First Peter, uh, this book, is about how we can live in such a way uh, that troubles and pain and suffering uh, that eventually come into our lives uh, would not. Crush us or make us weaker. Uh, it's about how we can become stronger, refined in character, and turned into great people as a result of it. Uh, how can you live in such a way? How can you be in such a condition that uh, the troubles and the pains and the sufferings of life actually uh, become tools uh, that make you better people? Uh, in today's Bible passage, we're told uh, we need to be holy then in order to come out strong uh, whenever we're hit hard, uh, we need to be holy. In fact, in verse 13, uh, we're told, therefore, uh, preparing your minds for action uh, and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What this means is uh, to not get distracted. There are many distractions in our lives, many things uh, that fight for our attentions, but to not get distracted is the instruction uh, that Peter is giving us. If you want to become stronger, if you want uh, to come out uh, more beautiful, uh, if you want to not be crushed uh, or be destroyed whenever hard times uh, come your way, then be holy. Uh, and what that means uh, is for us uh, to actively be ready, uh, to be prepared uh, for action uh, that our God has uh, prepared for all of us uh, to take part in. And in order to do that, uh, we need to stop being distracted by the worldly things. Uh, it also means to concentrate, to focus completely uh, for uh, action to live as the people of God. How many of us, how many of you are able to live uh, that kind of life? How many of you are actively living uh, that kind of life? Are you distracted? Or are you not distracted? Are you focused on God? Or are you not focused on God, but, on, but focused on other things? You know, these are the questions that we need to ask ourselves daily. Because you know as well as I do, uh, including myself, we often get uh, torn away from the very presence of God, of who he is, how good he is, and of all the good teachings uh, of his. So in, verse, in verses 15 and 16, we're told, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So uh, from this uh, passage of today, we learn 
two things. Number one, God is holy. And number two, uh, we must also be holy. And we can be holy because God is holy. Okay, two things. God is holy. And number two, uh, we must also be holy. The first part then, God is holy. Why should we know that God is holy? Why should we pay attention to uh, this truth that God is holy? What does it mean for God uh, to be holy? A lot of people misunderstand this word holy. And oftentimes, uh, because of that misunderstanding, whenever they use the word holy or think about uh, the word holy, something negative uh, comes out. It has a negative connotation for many people. Uh, they see somebody who is who claims uh, who somebody who claims themselves to be holy uh, to be someone who is conceited, somebody who acts like they're above you, uh, somebody who uses uh, that term uh, to make uh, less of you. So that's how often uh, this term holy is perceived. Uh, but the scriptural definition of what holy is is completely different from uh, the way the world and the people kind of twist uh, the meaning of that word. Uh, in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament Hebrew, since verse 16 is straight out of uh, the book of Leviticus, uh, we have to go back to the Old Testament, look at uh, the word in Hebrew. And in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for holy is kadosh. And kadosh uh, literally means to be separate, uh, to be distinct, uh, to be set apart. So if we attach that meaning, use that meaning uh, to the whole phrase, God is holy, uh, we understand that God is separate from something, uh, that God is distinct from something, uh, that God is set apart from something. And that something uh, is, do you know what that is? From this world, uh, from us, uh, from the fallenness of the whole universe. He is distinct, set apart, separate from sin. And that's how we are to understand uh, our God as we use the term, uh, God is holy. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2, uh, so therefore, uh, there it says, There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. What is it saying? It's saying God is unlike any other, and his holiness is the essence of that otherness. His very being is completely absent of every trace of sin. You see, because he's apart, he's set apart from this world, which is fallen. For us, you know, we, we sometimes think, you know, the holiness of God, when we, whenever we talk about him being holy, uh, we're kind of puzzled, because uh, especially if we understand it like this, that he is very removed, very apart uh, from us. Because we've been taught from very little uh, as we came to church that God is near us, God is with us. You know, Emmanuel, you know, Jesus Christ has given that name. You know, being with us. Uh, he calls us and uses intimate terms like um, he is our father. Uh, Jesus is, you know, our groom. We are his bride. Uh, at some point, uh, Jesus even calls us his friends because the Bible uses intimate terms like, you know, father, um, groom, bride, uh, friend. We often think that um, that's all who God is. Him being, uh, you know, down uh, in, our, in our world. Him being like us. And us identifying, you know, with him. But every time we talk about the intimacy of God and how close he is to us, we have to understand the only reason why we're able to 
embrace that intimacy is because of his grace. Because the reality, uh, according to the scripture, is that we are all sinners. And as sinners, we could never, ever get close to God. And as a result of that, you know, we've been cast aside. We've been kicked out of Garden of Eden. There was no way for us to find God, nor even to look for God. We had no uh, power or ability uh, to uh, be uh, with God. Heaven uh, was just a dream. What we actually uh, were uh, set up to, to, to go to uh, was hell. Uh, that's what the scripture says. Because of sin, uh, we were all dead uh, in our transgressions. Spiritually, we were dead. And in actuality, uh, we were all destined uh, to, to be separated from God uh, and die forever. But it was only because of God's grace that he decided to save us, that he loved us, uh, that he decided to sacrifice his one and only son Jesus for our sake and pay the price of our sins on the cross. That now we can call him Abba Father. That now we could consider Jesus Christ as our groom. That now we could consider Jesus as our friend. That we could approach our God with much intimacy. It's all grace, you see. We forget that. We forget that. Because, once again, the reality is, is that compared to us, if we compare ourselves to him, we are nothing. We are so little and so insignificant uh, in being that we are uh, calling, we are able to, the only way we are to describe him uh, is to describe him as holy. Someone who is off the scale. You know, he doesn't live by you know, our standard that he is you know, far from human uh, grasp. God is, like, God is unlike any other. That he is very uh, you know, absent of even trace of sin. That he is high above any other. And no one can compare to him. God's holiness pervades his entire being and shapes all his attributes. That his love, so therefore, is not human love. It's a holy love. His mercy is not human mercy. It's holy mercy. And even his anger and wrath uh, are holy anger and holy wrath. It's of another uh, level. That's how we are to understand him. Now these concepts, of course, uh, are difficult concepts uh, for human beings to grasp, uh, just as God is difficult for us to understand uh, in his entirety. But this is who he is. By nature, uh, we cannot get close to him. He was and he is far removed. But by grace, he came close to us. And uh, he considers us uh, his. He, so he brings us into his, or up to his level. Uh, that's uh, probably a best way for us to understand uh, his holiness and his grace. So therefore, don't treat him like he is one of you. Uh, meaning, don't treat him like someone with limited understanding and limited action. He is perfect. We're not. Uh, he must be treated and trusted. You know, we must not complain or doubt him because he is holy. Every time, you know, we're hit with something hard, difficult, uh, when we're down and out, you know what we usually do? We usually... Uh, blame God, especially if you go to church. I go to church, I attend service, I do my, you know, uh, offerings, I do, you know, give myself to services, I say I believe in God, and yet, 
Why is this happening to me? Why am I going through such difficulty? You know, why is good things, you know, happening to, you know, my friend next to me, but why, why is this, you know, why is this bad thing happening to me? Why does he not love me? Uh, we pity ourselves, uh, but ultimately that pity uh, translates to us complaining uh, about the way our lives are being controlled by God. But if we understand our God to be holy, then he has a different understanding of what's happening uh, in our lives. We may see what's happening, uh, you know, to be something very negative uh, for us. We may see these things to be something uh, that is destroying us. But our God is saying, actually, no. You know, you're my son. You're my daughter. What's happening to you right now, the painful thing that's happening to you, the suffering that you're going through, the difficulty, the storm that is blowing your way, that actually is for your growth. It's for your perfection. Uh, it's so that your character uh, may be uh, honed and your character may be made perfect. So don't treat him like he is one of us. Someone who is limited in understanding, limited in wisdom, limited in action. And I think that's the reason why uh, we become afraid and we doubt God. Because we think he's like us. We know very little and we can do very little. And yet, we think the other way. We think we could play God. We think that we could decide you know, our lives, and we could set plans, you know, all on our own. We think we could do all things without God. But if you understood the holiness of God, uh, you would know how to trust him and say, even though my life is difficult right now, oh Lord, you are holy. You know better. What I know is that you are holy in every aspect, including your goodness, your love, your wisdom. Everything about you is holy, above and beyond, and on a different plane that even though I can't solve it, even though I can't understand it, even though I, I have a hard time embracing it, I know you will make all things, all things, out to be good. All things uh, to be uh, that which is pleasing in your sight. So Lord, even my hurt and pain, I give it unto you. I pray that you will turn that into something beautiful. Now, so he is holy in that way, and so therefore he calls us to be also holy. Holy in all our conduct. So what does it mean for us to be holy then? Does it mean that we're like God, that we're transcendent uh, from the world that we live in? This is where I think some people make the mistake of kind of communicating arrogance, conceit to the people around. Because, you know, these people act like they're above and beyond everybody else. But that's not what that means, uh, what it means. Uh, if we once again understand the term holy uh, to be set apart, to be separate uh, from something, uh, then we could also understand that when God uh, told Israel to be holy in the book of Leviticus, uh, as he uh, was instructing them to be holy, uh, he instructed them to be distinct from other nations uh, by giving them specific regulations uh, to govern their lives in the same way we are to be holy, uh, to be separate and to be distinct from uh, the world that surrounds us. He is holy, so therefore now we are holy because we belong to him. We are in his realm now. And we no longer follow uh, the, the ways and the means uh, of this world. In the Old Testament, Israel was 
God's chosen nation. And God had set them apart from all other people groups. Uh, They were his special people. And consequently, they were given standards uh, that God wanted them to live uh, by so the world would know they belong to God. Uh, A lot of things uh, that they had to do differently. All the stuff that they picked up and learned and, uh, you know, put into practice, uh, made it into their culture uh, for a while, especially when they were in Egypt. In the book of Exodus, people of God are are brought out of Egypt, Egyptian culture, uh, into the wilderness, actually where there's no culture, and God gives them a new culture, his kingdom culture, and tells them that they are to be holy people, holy nation, uh, because he is holy. And in the same way he did that with Israel, he is calling all the believers of today uh, to do the same. So when Peter repeats the Lord's word uh, from the Old Testament in today's uh, text, he's talking specifically to all believers. And as believers, uh, we need to be set apart from the world unto the Lord. Set apart from this world and be uh, said unto uh, our Lord. That we need to be living by God's standard, uh, not by worlds. Uh, God isn't calling us to be perfect, uh, but to be distinct you know, from the world. Uh, in the same book, uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 9, then describes all believers as a holy nation. Uh, it is a fact We are separated from the world. Uh, We need to live out that reality in our day-to-day lives, uh, which Peter tells us to do uh, in today's passage. Let me give you some areas in in our lives, in your lives, uh, that this calling to be holy uh, applies. Uh, And these are, you know, hot topics that we should be thinking about. I want you to think about. Uh, Number one, technology. How do you view technology? Technology uh, can become either an an instrument through which we fulfill our role uh, as God's stewards or an object of worship that will eventually dominate us. A Christian worldview uh, provides balance and insight for understanding this crucial aspect of 21st century life. You are to embrace technology. It's not sin to use your phones, use computers, use other forms of technology, technological advances uh, that our ancestors never enjoyed or were able to embrace. That's not, that's not a you know, sinful thing for you to do so. But it turns into sin. It uh, does not separate you from this world once you get dominated by it. Once you worship it, once you feel you can't live uh, without it. Our God throughout history blessed uh, this world with many forms of technology. And using technology, our forefathers, people in faith, glorified him, spread the word of God. Uh, They were even more effective Uh, in, you know, doing uh, the kingdom's work. But then again, on the flip side, humanity also used technology to try to erase God uh, from their culture. We must not make the same mistake. Embrace technology, but figure out a way to use that technology uh, for that holy living. Number two, How about another hot topic, sexuality and marriage? Sexuality has become a major topic for many people these days. Uh, So much confusion exists among Christians and non-Christians. Well, sexuality is good uh, in the covenant relationship of mutual self-giving marriage. 
Sexual intimacy, separated from covenant marriage, is sinful and has a distorted meaning. It has a self-serving purpose and negative consequences. I say this, and some of you will call me a boomer. But no matter what you call me, this is what the scripture teaches. This, you know, idea, this truth must be embraced by all people belonging to God who is called to be holy. You learn, I know, your, your meaning or understanding of sexuality and marriage from friends. You learn from TV shows. You learn from movies. You learn from secular teachings. No wonder you're confused. Well, you come to church. You believe in God. And he has called his people from Old Testament to New Testament to be holy, to think differently, embrace different values. And with sexuality and marriage, uh, we are to have a healthier, edifying, something that is uh, very necessary uh, that the scripture teaches for all of us. It truly honors him and it truly protects you. Number three, how about environment? That's another hot topic, isn't it? Environmental stewardship means we have a responsibility to the non-human aspects of God's creation. Since God's plan of redemption includes his earthly creation as well as human, uh, we should do all we can to live in it carefully and lovingly. But one thing we must never do is to worship it. So many environmentalists, so many religions of this world worship the environment. But Christians, we don't worship environments. We are stewards, and we are to take care of the environment. And the reason? Because God created the environment. Number four, how about arts and recreation? Because this is so important for so many of you. The arts and recreation are understood as legitimate and important parts of human creativity and community. They express what it means to be created in the image of God. As God was the creator, as our God was creative, uh, we too also can be creative. We need to, so therefore, develop critical skills of analysis and evaluation so that we are informed, intentional, and reflective about what we create, see, and do. I want all of you, if you have the talent and the calling to be, you know, artists, uh, create things, uh, you know, as you engage in, in, you know, different forms of recreation, you know, I want all of you to be excellent uh, in those fields. But be excellent by being holy uh, people, creating holy things uh, for God. Number five, how about science and faith? For almost two centuries, science has been at the forefront of our modern world. We must explore, you know, how we see scientific issues from the vantage point uh, from a, of a Christian worldview. An understanding of God often includes uh, the knowledge where we, we gain through scientific investigation. Only with the lens of faith in place, a, a true picture of God's world appears. It is this picture that complements and harmonizes the findings of science and the teachings of scripture. Our God is God of truth. He will not lie. Everything about this world, if science can be used honestly, if the scientists could be honest with their findings, then they will know 
that everything our God, you know, communicates to us in the scripture uh, is true. Some things, though, cannot be uh, proven through scientific investigation. It's just something that our God uh, is and, and how he does things. But for the most part, science is not against faith, Christian faith. Actually, Christian faith embraces science because it's the natural way our human beings with given abilities and talents you know, understand the surroundings. If we're able to do it, uh, again, in a genuine, sincere, and, and truthful way, uh, then it, it will actually you know, illumine uh, everything that our God has to say uh, in the scripture. Lastly, how about vocation? You know, important for any culture is an understanding of work, right? Work is a gift from God, not a punishment. And it is to be pursued with excellence for God's glory. We recognize that all honest professions are honorable. That the gifts and abilities we have for our vocation uh, come from God. And this, uh, you know, uh, brings prosperity and, and promotions. And we have to understand that these things also come from God. At work, at home, wherever you are, if you're called to live a certain way, uh, then that way of living, your profession, also needs to be set apart for God's honor and for his glory. And when you do that, again, your work is going to be awesome. Uh, it's going to be unique. It's going to be beautiful. That is going to truly bless you know, this world. Now, these are only few examples that will help shape our thinking, uh, you know, in other areas of our lives. If you are confused about uh, any subject that clashes with Christian faith, you know, speak with Pastor Kenny, myself, uh, or anyone who is firmly grounded in Christian faith. You must examine your thoughts and opinions with the help of the Bible. And do it with peers and mentors uh, who are walking in Christian faith. And of course, you can do it alone, uh, but that's how a lot of people end up becoming, you know, heretics. That's how cults oftentimes uh, start. Because they try to do it all alone. But when you bring together the thinkings uh, and the faithfulness and the minds uh, of faithful uh, Christians together, and you know when that understanding is confirmed by the scripture, uh, then something good uh, will result. It's always better and safer when you can confirm your belief with credible sources. That's common sense. My brothers and sisters, in today's short passage, we're reminded uh, that our God is holy. Thank God he is. And along with him, by his grace, uh, now we are uh, called to be holy. Separated from this world, but be devoted to God for his purpose only. And when you do that, your life will change. Your life will turn around. Your life will never be the same. Daily, you and me, we need to repent. Daily, we need to reshape and readjust the way we think. And throw away garbage thinkings and the worldview of you know, this world. Embrace the worldview of our God. And, uh, you know, I, I wish you would come off humble, uh, but also intriguing and wonderful and beautiful uh, to this world. What is wrong with that guy? Something is different from me, but that guy, he's special. He's beautiful. Uh, 
I want to get to know him. What does he have that I don't have? Why is he at peace? And why is he rejoicing in the middle of that suffering? What is wrong with him? That person will later find out, no, there's nothing wrong with him. There's something right with him. That is the reason why he stands out. And that's Jesus Christ in his life. I pray that uh, people will know that uh, you are Christians you know, by the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, by you know, his life uh, in you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for being holy and also to bring us into that uh, holy realm and making us yours. O oh Lord, as your people, people with heaven's citizenship, Lord, help us to bless our surroundings, help us to uh, bring, bring about good uh, into this world, uh, but most of all, allow us to uh, give true blessing to this world by effectively sharing uh, the gospel of our Lord Jesus. We thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.